Craig Varen. Thank you. Hello. I went to see a concert the other night back where I live in the States. As I approached the venue, the security guard wanted my attention, so he goes like this. He goes, excuse me, friend. Excuse me, friend. Hey, friend! <laughs> Weird use of the word friend. Virtually no friend vibe at all. Like I had a hard time imagining a friendship blossoming from this encounter. <laughs> he goes, excuse me, friend. I'm going to have to take that chain wallet from you. I'm going to have to nix the chain wallet and your bracelet. And I was like, why? Because of the wars? Terrorism? Upgrades to security? That sort of thing? He goes, no. I go, why? He goes, because you're 40. <laughs> that's not, no, that's not funny. That's not nice. And I'm 46. <laughs> yeah, I use an eye cream. And, um... <laughs> I had this moment and I started thinking, fuck, am I getting too old to rock? Like, can you be too old to rock? Is that possible? Can you be too old to rock, do you think? Yeah. What do you think? No? You're nice people and you're all full of shit. Listen to me. <laughs> Let's do an experiment. Be 18 for a minute. Be 18 in your head. Now, go to a concert. You're 18, you're rocking out, you're at a concert, you're having a good time, the band's on, you're getting loaded. Woohoo! Look around. Uh-oh, who's that? Creepy old guy. <laughs> yeah, now you remember me. Creepy. Old, rocking solo, came by himself. Getting old's a bitch, man, and there's a lot of young dudes here tonight, and I know you're looking at me like, I ain't going out like that, bro. <laughs> oh, yes, motherfucker, you are, so listen to me tonight. Hear me. <laughs> listen to me with your tight skin and your judgment, because... <laughs> yeah. It's not like you think it's gonna be. You think you have time, you do not. You know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's like one day you're a vital dude with plans and information, boom, next day you're an old man. Old man, you got a brand new vocabulary, new words you're using, ointment. Not as a joke, as a fact. <laughs> so I kind of like him. I love him. He smiles. He's fun. Uh, at the same time, uh, he has uh, destroyed my life. <laughs> Why? Because I, I, as a, as a, as a guy who's an actor and a writer and a comedian, I've spent my entire life getting to a point where I had complete and total freedom. Ugh. Like that was what I always wanted. Yeah. I wanted a job where I could make a decent living mm. and go to a cafe when I wanted and go do whatever the fuck I wanted any time. And now that's all. I didn't know how much it would be over. <laughs> this little fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm gonna like wake up one night and he's gonna be hovering over me, just <laughs> <laughs> sucking the life. What do you What do you call the kid? Asshole? No, uh, I call him Finnegan. That's because that's his name. His name is Finnegan. Yeah, he's a little. Uh, he's gonna be a little he's drunk a Irish guy. On a <laughs> he put a lot of pressure on that kid. Yeah, he's gonna live up to. Yeah, him. he's gonna get a lot of fights, and uh, he's gonna drink whiskey, and there's gonna be, gonna be a lot of punching. Have you started with that already? How old is he? He does not drink whiskey yet. Uh, he's, How old he's is he? Six months. Oh, what are you waiting for? <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know if he can handle it. I don't know if he's got the. Uh, he looks like he's gonna be angry. He's gonna like a drunk. <laughs> I'm the nicest gent now. He's fucked. That's what angry guys always do in, in a pinch. You're like, no, people just don't understand me. No, they, I'm very sensitive. <laughs> I'm sweet. Just not in front of people. <laughs> no, I, I will not deny that I'm angry and I won't. I won't. Yeah. No, he's, he's going to have a little bit of the uh, little, little bite to him. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to This Week in Comedy. Uh, I'm Ed Krasnick, and I'm dressed like an Italian soccer star for no apparent reason. It's a big night. We have a big show. We have great guests. And uh, I had too much coffee, and I'm on something called Levaquin, which is an antibiotic, uh, which apparently uh, makes you see double and triple vision. So right now, uh, I'm seeing everything in 3D at half the cost. Um, it's really great to, uh, to be with you. This, of course, is the show that's all about comedy from the creator's uh, perspective. We have writers, directors, actors, producers, uh, filmmakers, uh, people who make TV. Tonight, we have an amazing show. Um, a gentleman who 
has done so many different kinds of great things in his life um, and in his performing life um, as well. He is an author, he is a screenwriter, he is a performer, uh, he's a dad, he's a husband, uh, he is a, uh, he's a magnate, um, he is a terrific uh, musician and, and really knows more about music than anybody I've ever met and he is Greg Berent and he is going to be here joining us shortly. And along with Greg, a gentleman who uh, is an actor and a writer, terrific comedian, um, and has a podcast along with Greg called Walking the Room, which we'll talk about a little later. Mr. Dave Anthony is here tonight. Uh, and along with, along with those guys, we have uh, Julie Mitchell coming up shortly uh, with the Comedy News. We have Vicki Pezza, uh, who has uh, a report about a film festival and some other things she's going to be talking about. And uh, we also have, coming up shortly, uh, via Skype, our first Skype performance. This is like when the Ed Sullivan Show, when they went to Miami to do uh, Mitzi Gaynor. Um, it's no different than that. It's a live thing. Um, Bobby Joe Abola and the Children McNuggets are here. It's, uh, Corbett, uh, Cor it's Corbett and Dan. Uh, they are from the Bay Area, and they are a terrific singing duo. They'll be here in just a minute just a few minutes. Um, I'm excited. I, I, I got to tell you, um, there's so many great things happening, but the first one is uh, that I wanted to tell you about is last night I was home and I was watching a commercial for Time Life, and they've got a new series, and it's called The Nazis is the name of the series, and I'm not making this up at all. They have decided to market the Nazis to a whole new audience, um, young people, and to do it with sort of a filmmaking kind of a commercial spin, what happened is, uh, this actually is true, they hired, I think, a young voiceover person who's trying to break into the movies, and this is exactly the commercial. You see footage of Nazis, and they say, 10 hours of the most spine-chilling adventure you're ever going to see, the Nazis. And it's real Nazi propaganda footage, and they are selling it like it's a some kind of a you know like it's a it's the Terminator or it's some kind of film. The Nazis are getting way too much press. I'm sorry, um, Hitler if he got residuals would be a very rich man today. Um, it's too much. We have to start going the other way. Life affirming stuff. I want to see things uh, about people who are botanists. I want to see things where people grow flowers. Um, I want to see someone make a good cup of tea now and again. Why doesn't Time Life Libraries, why don't they do that? Show, show people who are actually helping other people. I don't know. Anyway, that really was amazing to me, this whole Nazi thing. And, and, and then they did this thing where, uh, and if you order now, we'll chop $20 off of it, and we'll bring you a set of steak knives. Um, it's too much, and it has to stop. Okay, Time Life, <laughs> on, on notice. Um, along, with the, uh, along with the Time Life people, uh, I work on this show. Which, uh, it's a show involving Chelsea Handler and, and the show uh, Chelsea Lately. And we were in the office, and a couple of the writers and I were looking at different comedians. And somebody was trying to show me a, a clip of Monique um, and told me that she is hysterically funny and I have to watch her, and I actually know her, I don't know her well, but I've met her, uh, and I watched the clip, and then I made them watch Richard Pryor live in concert, and I kind of showed them the two, the two of them, and, and both, you know, she's very funny and very talented, but Richard Pryor was a guy who talked from his life experience, so he wasn't talking in generalities, he talked about everything that he had experienced, and, and he left a part of himself on stage. And when I was, before I started doing stand-up, um, I actually, uh, it's okay, do you, uh, is she okay? I want to make sure. You're all right? Uh, we have a, um, somebody's having a tracheotomy here in the studio. We don't, we don't, everything is live. It's live and we're about being human. So if you have to have a tracheotomy in the middle of a show, we're going to do that. We don't care. Sometimes it happens and you have to do it. Um, I don't know what I say. Anyway, Richard Pryor, we were talking about, uh, you know, he was somebody who spoke from his life experience and then acted it out. And when I was a kid, uh, before I started doing stand-up, I wrote a letter. I read a, an article about Rollins and Jaffe, who were Woody Allen's managers, and Billy Crystal and Robin Williams, etc. And they said, we only want to represent people who leave a little something on stage for you. They leave a piece of themselves 
and they, they, that's the kind of person that, that we feel as an artist that we want to represent. And that's the kind of person that, that I really love to watch you know, perform. There's all kinds of comedy and a lot of it, it's great and whatever your particular bent, whatever your style, you know, whatever your take, it's a very objective, uh, subjective thing, you know. Um, but I think if you're a performer that, that it's a great thing to actually let the audience know who you are. And this is why I like, um, that's why it's kind of interesting to me, Chelsea Handler. Chelsea seems to be a person, I think she lets the audience know who she is, and I think she is becoming famous for being the person that she is, which is a very rare thing. Uh, Jack Benny, uh, many years ago, he was sort of one of the first guys on TV to do it. Anyway, being a human being, being a comedian, this is a time when those two things are merging. Paul Provenza's show, The Green Room, certainly proves that. And tonight we're going to show that because we have some great guests uh, uh, coming up uh, this evening. Um, I also wanted to continue with my list of things because it's Thanksgiving, things that I'm thankful for. Uh, last week I started the list. Uh, I have to practice being, uh, being grateful. I, I think I'm way too um, uh, self-centered. And in other words, I'm a Jew. No, I, I, I have to really get out of myself, you know. So uh, things that I'm thankful for. And I'll, I'll do like a quick sort of list here. Uh, I want to say the ocean, um, and in that vein, Billy Ocean, if you've seen him or heard him recently, very, very nice. Um, trees, my daughter the other day put her hand on a tree, and I actually saw the tree move. The tree actually responded to her. Uh, she's amazing. Porches, I loved porches when I was a kid growing up. We had a porch. My mother would talk to people from the porch as they passed by. Oh, look at this. It's Harriet. Harriet, how are you, sweetheart? God, she looks wonderful. Don't you look wonderful? Have a good day, sweetheart. See you later. Looks just like a truck. You ever see a truck go down the street? What the hell happened to her? That's the beauty of a porch. It's a contained area where you can say anything you want and it doesn't uh, come back to haunt you. Um, I'm thankful that I grew up at a time when there was, uh, my uncle owned a ride called the Rotor. Um, I'm not gonna go into it, but I, I grew up playing skee ball. Uh, I grew up. Uh, uh, I grew up collecting sea glass in the summers. Um, I'm very grateful for that. And I think what I'm most grateful for is uh, the fact that I'm uh, the fact that I have a nice family. I'm alive. I have a great daughter, a great wife, and uh, I'm also grateful that um, I'm grateful that I am not a pilgrim, basically, because who wants to wear those outfits? Come on. Really, between you and I, is that good? All right, welcome to This Week in Comedy. Uh, it's a big show, and tonight we're gonna uh, start it off very shortly with a, a lady who is a terrific actress and a comedian, and somebody who almost had to have a tracheotomy. Um, would you please say hello to Julie Mitchell? <laughs> Julie? Sorry, and I'm you don't, sorry. <laughs> you don't have to be sorry. Now, something happened to you. You became, you, you were overcome with something. It's called emotion. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what it's called? Yeah. I'm not much. familiar with that. I don't know. Only I in got, therapy. I got choked up. <laughs> you did. You did. You got a lot going on. I do. I do. <laughs> this week is Thanksgiving. I wore a necklace. <laughs> there is a lot going on, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a lot. To, that's a lot to shoulder. Um, now, Julie, I have to ask you, you um, you're going to be on TV Monday night, tomorrow night. No, I'm not. You are not going to be on TV. No, and something really bad happened. What happened? I'm not on TV on Monday, and I thought I was. Because what IMDB said, and by the way, it's not I'm like I thought, it's IMDB, and you didn't correct me. I, and that was embarrassing. Sorry. And it said I was going to be on House on, on the 22nd. You were going to be on House. That's what it said. Right. And my mom took out an article in the paper, and she told everybody in my town. And now it turns out I'm not going to be on. And so she looks like a liar in front of the town and in front of God. Again. Mm. What, uh, <laughs> what, what, when are you, do you know when you are going to be on? Well, it's the next episode, but they won't tell you when it's going to air, and I don't know what to tell people. Everybody's so confused about it. Were you preempted by It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown? Because I'm so sick of those people. Well, I don't know. I don't know. Charlie anyway. Brown Thanksgiving yeah. comes on ABC on Thursday night after yeah. you've had your turkey. Yeah. No, I'm asleep uh, about an hour after. I, ju I just doze off until next year. 
Um, but uh. now, you, what's going on? Now, there's other stuff going on. I know too. You've you've been doing stand up, and uh, you've got uh, you've got some statistics for us. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what you're doing. I don't know. <laughs> What's don't happening? make up my segment for me. Ed. What's ha I mean, I've got statistics, what, but you have something else. Well, if you don't want to watch Charlie Brown Christmas, which I personally don't, because it's a cartoon, right. I'm going to watch Pretty Women. That's a pretty, I mean, Pretty Woman. I'm going to watch Pretty Women. No. Pretty Women is like the porn version. I'm not watching that. No. I'm watching Pretty Woman. Pretty Woman. It's a movie with Julia Roberts. And it's going to be on USA on Thursday night. That's what you're doing Thanksgiving night? Yeah. But there's also, Hallmark has one called The Town That Christmas Forgot. Oh, yeah. That's really good. That's I, I remember that one. Mm. I mean, I forgot that one. No, it, that's, a, that's a great uh, motion picture. Do you know what that one's about? That's up. Is that? It's about some rich people that move into a town, and then they prove that rich people aren't all a-holes. Sounds tremendous. Uh, no, what? What? what uh, that's on Hallmark. Yeah, but there's other things. Check your local listings. There's other what? things. You can go to the movies if you if you like dancing. You can see burlesque. If you like. If um, you like movies, you should probably not see burlesque. But if you like dancing, <laughs> maybe. then you can see burlesque. Yeah. Um, if you like hair, then you could see Tangled. I if, can't talk about hair ever since I turned 51. <laughs> <laughs> I like to call this Area 51. How are you? <laughs> um, all right, so now, uh, and, uh, and, and then what can you see? Oh, you after? can, um, if you like love and other drugs, then you can watch Harry Potter. <laughs> that was my joke, Ed. That was a good joke. That was a joke. I loved it. No, I'm, I'm laughing on several levels. <laughs> oh, that's um, good. Now, uh, now, so this is all the stuff that you can do on Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. What do you normally do? Like, what is your, do you have a ritual or a tradition? Well, be my husband and my best friend and um, my husband's allergic to turkey that's one of the things I don't like about him perfect and um, so we can't have any of the traditional Thanksgiving so we're gonna have hot dogs with cheese in them that sounds like a great substitute <laughs> very American yeah. yeah I like the kind with cheese in them have you ever had that I'm not allowed to have cheese Oh. I would say the Museum of Lactose Intolerance joke, but I think somebody's done it already. Well, let me ask you really fast. What's your um, favorite movie that has Thanksgiving in it? My favorite movie that has Thanksgiving in it is probably, uh, I, I would say, home, uh, oh, no, there's a great, I can't remember the name of it. I think it's Christmas in Connecticut. No, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's about a guy bringing somebody home to the wrong holiday. But no, it's Home for the Holidays would be my favorite movie. So then what was the other thing you just it's went It's a Preston on? Sturgis film, and I think I got it wrong. Oh. So in the middle, I shifted gears pretending that I knew what I was saying, <laughs> which is really the story of my life. Home for the holidays. That's a good one. Vicky, can you name one? Vicky Pezza, everybody. Hey. Um, Thanksgiving movie. Uh, Grindhouse, does that count? That is a Thanksgiving trailer. <laughs> I don't think it counts as a movie or a trailer or a house. Um, I don't know what... Uh, is Patrick Swayze in that? I'm so oh. old, I can't even relate wow. to anybody. I'll give yeah. you a hint. Yeah. There's, there's a famous Woody Allen movie that has something to do Wait. with Thanksgiving. Wait, it's, uh, it's Hannah and Her Sisters. Yes! Oh. Seasonally, that, that's a great, that's one of Got my it. favorite movies. And then one more. Steve Martin is, is, is trying to get home for, the, for Thanksgiving. Plane, Trains, and Automobile? Yeah. Fantastic. How about Woody Allen and Plane, Trains? No, I'm not going to do an impression. But, no, but really, that, that. That's, that's a great Those holiday movie. Those are good movie. holiday movies. Also, Raging Bull, if you haven't seen it. Uh, I always see that on Thanksgiving. I don't know why it's a ritual. It's, uh, I don't know. Anyway, that's just what me and my friend Jimmy do. Uh, Julie Mitchell, you're going to be on television on House. I hope so. Stay tuned because she's going to be on. We're going to hear about that. We're going to hear about your stand-up next time. Now, on the next show, which will be December uh, 5th, Sunday, December 5th, we're going to take a week off for the holidays, and then we'll come back with a great show. We'll tell you more about that. Okay. Give it up for Julie Mitchell, everybody. Come on. Are you, did you almost raise the roof? That was a, raised my fingers. You were like doing some masonry, I think, with this. I um, pumped it up. Yeah, it's cool. Okay. Thanks so much Thanks, for being Ed. here. You're the greatest. <laughs> um, okay, now I would like to, uh, I'd like to throw it. How about that? How about that for show business? I'd like to throw it over to uh, Vicky Pezza. Now, Vicky, you have gone to a film festival. We were going to do it last week and even the week before, <laughs> but now it's three weeks late. But it's yes. still, it still burns in your memory, doesn't it? Yes, it's for uh, a segment uh, called uh, This 
last month in comedy. Actually, <laughs> yes, we're going to do that. Actually, there's big news. We have a new segment coming up. Yes. That's coming later. Yes. So stay tuned. Mm -hmm. um, but right now, we're going to just roll a clip. It's from the International Shit Movie Film Festival in Hollywood. Um, it was at the Silent Movie Theater, October 24th. And Lon Strickland, who orchestrated the event, was nice enough to cut us a little package to roll in. So here that is now. Thank you, Lon. My wife, uh, Mary Ellen, and my son, Jerry Jr. Yo, boss! Lavelle Perry is a rare yet deadly occurrence. Hurry up, they're coming, come on! Wait up! We want to kill you! Wait up! We want to kill you! Chicken shack. Mm, tastes good. Flying saucer war. It's gonna snowman. I'm talking blowman. Oh, good. You must be Peter Winkler. Um, have a seat, and Mr. Thompson will be right with you. Okay. Uh, what's in the box? Is my leather executive office chair? Well, you can leave it back here. No. If you want to. My name is Benny Arthur. I have two shorts in the festival. My name is David Tuber. I've also had some work on Robot Chicken, Titan Maximum, Moral Oral, and I recently directed the uh, first season of Frankenhole. The greatest show is Frankenhole on Adult Swim. I mean, I fully sports. I love the whole giving Hollywood a dose of humility. Finding uh, people who've got a lot of good talent, who are really funny, but don't necessarily have the budget to do it yet. We're not so much interested in the dry comedy. It's more about the, the in-your-face, sort of over-the-top, uh, you know, insane, really creative, kind of absurd stuff that you don't see too often. Shit is a great word. Shit is one of my favorite swear words because it's so versatile. It can, it can mean so many things. If something is the shit, it's amazing. But if it's just shit, it sucks. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that's just one of the fun things about the word. You can sort of uh, interpret it in many ways. So there you have it. That's what I've been talking about since I've uh, been on this show. It's, there it's, it was. <laughs> it's hysterical. I mean, there's there's some very funny stuff, very interesting stuff, but I, I just love that it's called the International Shit Movie Festival. It's I mean, pretty great, Dave. I think that's brilliant. <laughs> I'm going to start uh, doing some other products. Yeah. Um, but but no, that that is, uh, and very creative people. Uh, and yeah. what, what are, the, are there any special parameters to submitting for this thing? Um, pretty much. Well, they're going to start looking for submissions yeah. right at the beginning of next year because yeah. um, they're going to keep this going. This was just the first annual one, but Excellent. basically uh, low budget, no budget, anything goes, um, shorts, comedy. It's, you know, we're looking to laugh basically. Sure. sure. But um, yeah, Lon Strickland put it together and his wife Roxy did a great job promoting it. And um, in that clip, Benny Arthur, he has a lot of stuff up on Funny or Die all yeah. the time. It's always hilarious. Yeah. And Dave Tuber works on more oral and robot chicken, and he directed 
the season of Mary Shelley's Frankenhole. So wow, we're hoping cool. he will be on in December. He'll definitely be a guest coming up. Great. So great. more to look forward to. Well, thank you so much, Vicki. That's, that's great. Uh, uh, that's p creative people coming together doing, doing something fun is uh, fantastic. A lot of great filmmakers out there, that's for sure. Um, could I have said anything more general? I don't know, but I loved it. I really, <laughs> la I really loved it. I loved the animation, especially the stop motion. I really enjoyed that. Um, Okay, here we go. Um, folks, I want to apologize. The show is running a little bit late tonight, a little bit long, uh, but rewards are on the way, okay? In the form of, uh, we're going to go live now, like I'm, like I'm on a spaceship or something. We're going to go live to uh, two of my favorite performers. These guys are from the Bay Area. Um, they are singer-songwriters, and uh, they perform all over the country. And it's a pleasure to have you. I'm going to say the band name, and then I'll say hello to you my name. Bobby Joe Ebola and the Children McNuggets. Corbett and Dan, how are you? Ed, good. You. Right. That's you quite, a, quite a lead up. That's a 40-minute lead up. Uh, so <laughs> I, I hope you guys have been able to put a roast in the oven while we've been on. <laughs> we had some tea. Yeah, I'm, very nice, very nice. Now, this is our first via Skype performance. We've interviewed a lot of people via Skype, but this is the first performance. So you're making history. Very nice. Awesome. Um, are you guys, uh, now you're going to do a song tonight, and then we'll talk for a few minutes afterwards, but you're going to do a song tonight that you did on a show that we did at the Throckmorton Theater. In fact, we had, we had a great time there. Well, you were great, and I loved the song so much, I, I, I demanded that you do the song. I know you have a lot of songs that you do, but I demanded it. And I wanted to say that, Ed, 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 you're very inspiring. You were inspiring to work with there, and you speaking uh, at the beginning of the show. Uh, we're here in my office. We've got Lenny Bruce on the wall, Richard Pryor. Uh, what you said about uh, performers who leave a bit of themselves on the stage, we love you, Ed. Oh, wow. thank you, guys. That's great. I, I, I love you, too. It feels the same way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cry during the song, I swear to God. <laughs> but, but no, uh, you're, you guys are great, uniquely talented, and uh, thanks for coming on the show. And tell us what the name of this song is, and, and have at it. It's called The Only Difference. Okay. <laughs> Which of your cars I will borrow? Will it be the Jaguar? Will it be the Benz? Be my friend and help me decide. Whoa, oh, 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 oh. the only night we have left to live is tonight. Whoa, 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 whoa. Your bank accounts don't mean a thing. I really don't want to hear it Be glad your duct tapes in your trunk And not in your burning condo Will we clear the drawbridge? Will we burn or drown? Will the tunnel end in light? Oh, 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 oh. the only night we have left to live is tonight. Whoa, 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 whoa. All right, Pete Tom Bosley. Just wanted to say that out loud. There's no ideology. No pantheon, no army you can call upon to save you. But if it makes you feel less alone, just think of what we have in common. With no more possessions, just meat and bones, too beautiful for a coffin. Whose little candle will sputter first? Let's look into each other's eyes. Whoa, whoa, the only night we have left to live. Yes, the only night we have left to live. Yes, the only night we have left to live. 
is tonight. Sit on it. That was that was hysterical. Oh my God! Uh, what happened to satire in this country? It's right there, right there tonight. Thank you guys so much. Um, you're terrific. Tell us, uh, tell us where what we can what we where we can find more music from you and uh, maybe some dates that you might be playing. And I think you have a film, you have a documentary. Tell us, tell us what we can look forward to. Well, we're we're playing at the Lexington Theater in Los Angeles coming up on uh, December fifth. Uh, also, we're touring the nation uh, from actually, uh, we're dropping in Minneapolis all the way to Boston for about 24 dates, uh, about six or seven dates in New York City from, uh, what is it, December 6th through the 20th okay. uh, of, of yeah, this we'll, year. We'll be in New York from like the 16th till the 18th, I think. Yeah, yeah. BobbyJoeBola.com, uh, we're on iTunes, uh, you can find us all over the web. We've got a new uh, music video, more music videos on the way. We're even on a cat lover site. We are. We found that out yesterday. Wow, that's amazing. You know, you guys are you guys are great. I want to thank you so much. You're going to come back, and we can great. do more. You know, even if you're traveling, we'll have you when you you know we'll we'll try to have you when you're in L. A. Also for the Lexington. Well, that'd be that'd be splendid. Okay. Anytime, man. Okay. Pleasure to have you, Bobby Joe Bull and the Children McNuggets, Corbett and Dan. Thanks a lot. All right, Bye. guys. Um, okay, we made history with Skype, uh, Skype performance tonight. Thrilled to have those guys. Look for them around the country. And uh, right now, I want to play a, just a short clip of, uh, of uh, another musician who's also a comedian, but who, whose love of music uh, transcends uh, comedy. And you can see it right here in this clip. This is a show called Bring the Rock, which Greg does uh, occasionally, and you don't want to miss it. Uh, it's a combination of storytelling and music, and it's very personal. It's a great show. Here's Greg from Bring the Rock, and then we're going to have an interview with him. Check it out. All right, that's, uh, that's Greg Barron from Bring the Rock, and we're so excited. I'm so happy to have him here. When I have breakfast with this guy, it's like, it's like, a, it's like a show in itself, and the next time I am going to bring a flip phone. <laughs> um, please welcome Greg Barron to the show. Greg? Hey, buddy. Oh, How are you? I'm good. I'm yeah. good. I'm so, you know, I love watching that because we talked about this before. You, when you're doing that show, yeah. you love music so much that it just radiates throughout the audience and throughout the, the kind of show that it is. And, and my question to you is, can you do that on television? Can I don't know. I don't know. But people have taken a stab at trying to turn that into a TV show, and it hasn't been successful. I don't know. I don't know if it's not a live experience or not. I can tell you this. Um, when I look at that clip, I think to myself, 
When I got the haircut, I assumed that I looked like a member of Bow Wow Wow, but looking at it now, I seem like a cast member from Glee, and that makes me nervous because I'm fast approaching 50. So I, I, uh, there's some, I have a sartorial moment when I watch it as well. Uh, uh, but an, I, yeah, yeah. anatonsorial moment. But, <laughs> yes. But no, yes, I, tonsorial is what I meant. <laughs> but I, have to say, I love that you knew that. Well, you, you look at my hair and you know that I, I started studying the tonsorial arts <laughs> in 1947 when I had hair. I remember that we did open mics together then. You, um, you know, you you started in in San Francisco. You started yep. in, the, in the Bay Area, and I have the vi most vivid memories of you and Margaret Cho standing outside the Holy City Zoo, and the fog was so thick that you couldn't see anybody's faces. You could just see like from like maybe here down. Right. And then the fog was up here, and we were all hoping to get some time on stage, and next to the Last Day Saloon. And I think it was the guy, Clarence Carter, who did uh, uh, Patches. <laughs> That's right. And yeah, yeah, with various members of the tubes walking up and down the street. <laughs> and then a giant hand came, grabbed Margaret, and pulled her right down to Los Angeles. She'd been doing stand-up for, I think she was, she'd been doing it for 25 minutes. Oh, amazing. And they pulled her up. They pulled and, her right uh, up. They and plucked my, her. Right. My first time on uh, uh, the uh, stage at the Holy City Zoo, I was 35th. On a, on a list of 37 people doing stand-up that night, and the guy in front of me had a panic attack. His name was Mel. And he went up, and he stared at everybody, and his eyes got watery, and he ran off stage, and then I was next. And, uh, and had that not happened, I don't know if I'd have continued, because there was no... I couldn't do worse than that, right? I had on short pants. I yelled for a few minutes, and then people were like, that's fine. I think of the five minutes I was given, I did three. And I said, I'm a genius, <laughs> celebrate me. And then we all would come and, and worship you. And, oh, uh, no, that uh, was... and that's how that, that went. And then I got my very first set in a real club because you gave a recommendation to me, Lisa Langang, at the Improv, and the rest is oh, that's amazing. comedy wow. history. Wow, that's yeah. amazing. Well, you know, I mean, the thing about that place, the Holy City Zoo, was it was like, it was like I don't know, there were like 60 seats or something like that. Yeah. And it was like a barn, like a small barn. Yeah, it was very, very small and, and deep. And, uh, and you were only a, like a foot away from the audience. Yeah. yeah, it was a really interesting, but an incredible place to do comedy. Yeah. Like an incredible place to do comedy. And, uh, but, you, but you were, you know, I mean, the, the thing about that, you know, people don't know like how important it is to have a set at a club and to actually have that experience, get it behind you, and then of course your next goal is to get past at the club, to be able to be somebody who could do a weekend. Yes, if you could only get that opening spot that Ed Marquez has, if you could only get, you know, they would put you up for five minutes at the improv, like it's just, and you just will go any, like you will drive 300 miles to do a guest set uh, on a show that Skip Stevenson's doing. <laughs> 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 right? Yeah, it's absolutely yeah. right. No, you want to be yeah. a comedian. You he's want going to die in a hotel later on, and yes. you're going to still love comedy. <laughs> you still want what he has. You were like, he got a hotel room, and he died there? And he died there. Right? Oh, my God. That is so true. Right? Like, it, you, we wanted would do, to, you wanted you would so drive, bad. You drive. You put yourself in peril. I remember one night, there was a lady who booked gigs in, like, Watsonville. Yvonne yeah. Walker, she booked a gig. Yeah. Barry Lank had given me a car. I didn't own a car, but he gave me a car that had no brakes. Right. And I actually drove it to Watsonville to be on yes, the show. right. Yeah. And then there's no place for you to stay, so I'm going to sleep inside of my own ideas tonight. <laughs> and then in the, I'm going to sleep in the warmth of my own comedy yeah. and then drive back to my whatever my shitty retail job was. But I think, I don't, th I don't think that people, or I, it probably doesn't occur to them, but the people that do stand up and continue to do it, you know, w want it so bad. And that, that when someone gives you money, you're not sure what it's for. <laughs> By the time you eventually get money, you're like, and this is for this is for performing tonight, and yeah. you're like, oh, I'd have done this for free. Like yeah. once, you know what I mean? Like it really is. Even now, I did. A, I was at Largo the other night, and I opened for John Bryan, and I did a set, and it was it was a uh, you know ten minute or fifteen minute set, and I and it was my pleasure yeah. to do the show. Yeah. And then Flanagan can put some money in my pocket. I'm like, I don't. It's not. I don't. I really don't. There are things I definitely do for money. Uh, but comedy never feels like one. You know what I mean? Like it is, I could easily do it not for money. What What inspired you to go into comedy? I mean, did you watch an uh, inability to do almost everything yeah, else? Yeah. Right? Yeah, sure. And that I could that I could be funny on occasion. And uh, and Margaret and I were in an improv group together called Crash and Burn. And she said you should do stand up. And I I was like, well, if you're kicking me out of the group, there's a better way to do it. <laughs> yeah. Than sure. to ask me to go solo. Sure. But she just sort of felt like it would be something I'd be good at. And my mom had always encouraged me to do it. Oddly enough, and so. 
I took a shot at it and I was good the first time I did it and then horrible at the next week at the a rose and thistle bad and then kind of okay and then better and, and you just start making it up as you go along and yeah. you know then we'd all start copying your cadence and your rhythm and then <laughs> we'd be you know it Mike Gandolfi or what was Bob Rubin doing or any sure. of those guys that were around Jeff Bolt and we just sort of you know found your way doing it so now here you are here you are in LA and here you are doing all these all these amazing things um, but you come back to uh, there might be cake which is a show that's going to be on IFC. I don't know that it is going to be on IFC. I think that it, I think that we are waiting for a long, slow pass. Uh, it's been we we shot a pilot that was essentially um, uh, me talking to the guys I started with. Yeah, yeah. About comedy, but then because we can't do that forever, who do you like now? Because when you look at the kids doing comedy now, you can't believe how good someone who's been doing comedy a year is. Yeah. But what we forget to understand is. They grew, a lot of the guys doing stand up right now grew up with the Comedy Central. That was around for them. They they are been weaned on comedy, so they've got these chops that you wouldn't expect them to have, which is great. It's like music, um, but I I'm just always so blown away, and I felt like it'd be great to do a sort of a pass the torch thing. Yeah. Where you you're like, hey, I'm gonna you should see Matt Bronger, you should see Kurt Braunall or a Nick Thune, a Tig Notaro, who whoever it is that you like, and I would have every week a different comic sort of curate and give their own. Uh, uh, you know, give their blessing to four comics and a comic that you, a missed comic, a comic you felt this guy should have gotten his due. Oh, man, that's so great. Right? A guy that you, because, you know, there's guys that we started out with, a Jeff Bull, the Bob Rubin, who, while we idolize, sure. didn't get the national recognition that they should have. Yeah, and in the case of, and I don't know about Bob, but in the case of Jeff Bolt, who's a very dear friend, and he's yeah. been on the show a couple times, yeah. Jeff chose to raise a family. He did. And he, he, he did. He definitely, I mean, he definitely decided not to come down here. But my own selfishness is, no, I want everyone to know. Yeah. I want everyone to know. Because, it, because if, if not for him, you know, when you would go see guys like that, you would stay in the game. There are guys that when you go watch them, you're like, I'm not going to quit. I can be that good. Yeah. This, is, this is an art. You know, there's a lot of guys that aren't good that we, you, you're sitting in a club watching somebody going, is this what we do? Yeah. Really? Yeah. No, this isn't it. This yeah. isn't it. Well, that's the thing. You know, and I remember this. You know, they call people a comics comic or they call whatever, you know, that you play to the comics. But some, of the, some people who are very artistic, you know, like do that. And they say you can't really score with the audience. Like you have to be your responsibility is to entertain the audience. I think your responsibility is to be as full a human being as you can be on a stage. Yes. I think that's the responsibility. Absolutely, and and why wouldn't you play to a group of people for whom comedy matters? And comics, the reason we play to other comics is because nobody loves it like we do. Right. And so if you get the approval of people that like comedy as much as you do, you feel like you've won. It's impossible not to play for other comics. You don't have to do it, but it but it definitely, it's nice to have a, a, a peer come up and say, I really loved your set. It makes, that to me, those are the night, those are the nights that make you go on and continue doing it because... Uh, you respect what they do. And now you become part of a community. Carrot Top, a community. thank you very much, Scott Well, Thompson. listen, he's amazing. You know, yeah, he he I like his trunk work. I do. <laughs> and I got to tell you, man, you know, that guy does some some shoulder presses. He'll go ahead and do, I mean, if you've seen his back, everyone's talking about his chest. Take a look at his back. That's where the action is. That's what makes the, the back. action the is in his back? What makes the chest look good is the size of your back. People don't know it. <laughs> Little secret to weightlifting, P90X. <laughs> P90X. I'm going to talk to you about that, too, in a yeah, minute. Sure. You know, do you know I, I don't think I ever told you this. My father was a, like a big weightlifter. No. Honest to God, my father was a bodybuilder. He was a weightlifter. And he, I've told this story on the show. <laughs> this is on, honest to God. As a kid growing up, uh, my father kept his weights in my room for some reason. Uh, and his baggage. <laughs> no, but he kept his weights in my room. And so uh, I would wake up to a man in boxer shorts and dress shoes <laughs> deadlifting 300 pounds. That's what I woke up to. So oh let me God. just say that is isn't any wonder. Was your dad the dad from The Wanderers? <laughs> <laughs> is that right? In the end, he slugged you in the sternum? Pretty much. Pretty wow. much. No, he had me do it. He brought his weights. He did, went over, not on the Normandy invasion, but he went over like the day after. Interesting. But he goes over on the boat. He's got two 40-pound dumbbells it's in the duffel bag. Why? And he's, his head is going under the water. I said, How, why do you do that? He said, where am I going to work out? His thing was working it off. That's but what he, he did. Uh, but also, he went into your room every day and said, you will not beat me. Yeah. And I'm doing it in my streets. That's right. I'm doing it in my street <laughs> shoes. <laughs> Squirt a few, mama's Ed boy. Ed Edward, <laughs> We're doing great Santini, uh -huh. even though it hasn't come out yet. Um, <laughs> I made you. I'm going to beat you. Oh, 
No, he was an. He was an. My father was an amazing guy. My father was. Uh, you know, they turned his. They wanted him to retire from the Department of Public Welfare. He was a social worker. They turned. They tried to force him out. He said, "Just because you try to force me out, I'm staying an extra two years." And they turned his office into a smoking lounge. <laughs> and he still stayed there in his boxer shorts with his weights, sitting in smoke. Because I'm not going out. I love it. I'm a fighter. I love it. Um, now, I, you know, I have to, I have to ask you about, well, I'm going to get back to Bring the Rock, too, but this is really an interesting time for comedians. This is a, I don't know why it's happening this way, but this is a time when comedians can actually, maybe can actually be people and funny in media. Yes. I don't know why. It might be due to the celebrity gossip culture. It might be in, people are interested in flaws and they're interested in the full, I don't know what it is. But it's happening with Prevenza's show. Yep. It's happening with other shows. Mm -hmm. You have it in in Bring the Rock in a very interesting way. This is a, you have a, you have created this show where people can come and tell stories and and do songs. Yeah. And so they get like a full a fuller picture of who they might be. So how did you come up with Bring the Rock and tell tell people what it is? My wife. Uh, it, um Used to work at Epic Records signing bands. Epic, that was a, a label that uh, folded, I think, a week ago. But it, uh, but she was friendly with a guy named uh, Tom Morella, who was in Rage Against the Machine. And one night at dinner, Tom told a story that I, I, I don't want to repeat because I'll wreck it. But it was basically about playing a concert with Slipknot and how Rage had been, were on first, and there was a big concert in Australia called Big Day Out and 80,000 people, and about how they had rocked it, and they were the best band that had ever performed, and nobody was better than them because of the control that they had of the audience, that they could make the audience jump up and down, and you would feel them on the other side of the earth. And Tom was quite sure that that day that they owned it. And he said, I'm standing off stage, and I'm waiting, and suddenly I hear absolutely nothing. It's pouring down rain, and I hear nothing. I don't hear a sound, not a note. I'm like, what is happening? And Slipknot has convinced those same people to lie face down in the mud before they play a note. We were bested without, being, without, without Slipknot playing a no moment of music. We were bested. And the, but the story told took about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And I said, I would pay $25 to go see you tell that story on stage. And then I'd like to hear you play a Slipknot song. That to me is an evening of entertainment because you've seen, you've seen vistas that I can't imagine. Mm -hmm. And people's relationship to music is so personal and so awesome that when they discuss it, that you can't help but not be, you can be funny, but you have to be real because it is real. And, those, and, and so that, because that music just hits you right here. And so I thought, well, let's see if we could put an evening together of people, not just comics, but actors or um, TV writers or you know any anyone come and tell a story about music and then either perform or have a band perform a song based on your story. And sometimes the band would incorporate other elements of your story to make a different version of the song. And uh, and it was just a you know one of those things. And I did it for me. I was I it, I had no intention of even trying to turn it into a TV show. I simply wanted to hear other people's stories. I was interested, I was like, as soon as I was off stage, I was now in the audience and I was enjoying, my, it was like a feast for me. Yeah. If I could have my dream show, what would it be? So I just gave it a shot and it's been, it's good, it's hard, it's a, it's a tough show to book because there's a lot of moving parts and a lot of elements and you have to get a band together and the songs and people's stories and you have to help coach people through their stories, but when we get it right, it really is an amazing thing. It's an amazing show. I mean, I love it. I, I saw a show with Ben Stiller playing the drums. Ben did a Rolling Stones st uh, st uh, story where he talked about pitching a movie to the Rolling Stones. <laughs> And Keith Richards said, are you going to direct it, Alfred Hitchcock? <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. And then Bron Wood said he would be interested in being in the movie. And Keith turned to him and said, is that right, Brian Jones? <laughs> and yeah. who has that story? Well, Ben has it. And then Ben played drums on Gimme Shelter. The lead singer of uh, Josh Homme from uh, Queens of the Stone Age came out. He told a story about... It's his belief that when somebody throws something on his stage, he gets to keep it. And in Germany, somebody threw a midget on stage. And he, <laughs> he, he felt that was his to keep. And so those are the kind of stories that you get. Brendan Walsh talked about taking mushrooms and missing a concert. I mean, it's just, uh, it's fun to hear those stories, yeah. you know. And also, you, you, you also the, the fun thing is taking a performer and pushing them into a thing for a night. This is not a bit you have to do forever. I've explained to the audience that you're t taking a risk. Yeah. So it, this does not have to be hilarious. In fact, if it's not hilarious, if it's personal, who cares? And so that's a sort of, there's a little bit of a high wire act going on where people have to kind of risk 
saying something personal for one night and then uh, follow it up with a song. You have the song as your closer, so you're not, you kind of can't lose. Right, you're going to get off yeah. well. Well, they, 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 but there's a couple key like elements to that that you, that you describe. And one thing is, you did it, I do it because it's something I love. You did it for yourself. You yeah. did it that you, it's something you wanted to do. Right. And the agenda is not to get anything from it. The agenda is to put on a show. Whenever I have, when I ever I have wanted something to happen, yeah. it absolutely will not. If I've decided to go out and do a thing, and I've gone with great intent, and I'm quite sure about what it's going to do, if I go out with that, with it like this will be a money maker, fails every time. And then I'm humbled and I'm bored, and I'm like, well, then I'll start a surf band. How about that? Nobody <laughs> wants that, but I do. <laughs> yeah. I want to listen to surf music in the comfort of my own car. Yeah. So I will make a record that I can listen to, and it's not for you, although I bought you one. Um, and then, you know, then I have a surf band and I, and then I have an experience that's genuine and it's real and it's something that, that is, uh, comes a hundred percent from me and it has no motive. Nobody in their right mind says, I'm going to make a record of instrumental music that's influenced by the Clash and by the Scottalites and a little bit like French film and expect anyone to want to hear a note of it. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. I didn't do this for the money. And then that ends up being something that's actually, uh, we had some songs licensed to MTV last week. So... You know, be, 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 for, yeah, I'm doing it because I love. But what comes through is that you love doing it. Right. That's what comes through. Right. And that's the thing I was talking about at the beginning. I I, I talked about somebody showed me a clip of Monique. Now, I'm not going to go see a show with Monique. I mean, it's just not my taste. Right. However, I can't deny that she loves doing what she's doing. No, absolutely. You cannot deny it. Right. And if you love it, what the audience feels is your love of it. They get it. They get it. When you look at something like Modern Family, yes, it's a well-written show. Every actor on that show wants to be on television in a way that you can't feel. And that, like, that Ty Burrell has been on a million things. He's never had his shot. Same with, with the, the wife. You can tell that these people are in it for real and the joy that they get from acting. That, like, you can just sense, you can sense, you can feel it on the television. They like what they're doing. Yeah. You know, when I worked on Sex and the City, it was the same thing. There was that tangible joy in what people were doing that came from another place where they really were like, I, this isn't just about me getting a paycheck. And yeah. it's rare because a lot of what you do is about being, and I've, I've gone for the paycheck. Yeah. You know, I've definitely <clears throat> taken jobs and said, well, I'm going to, my talk show, I was like, well, I'll, I'll try that. But I, it wasn't like I woke up, I, I had never in my youth said, you know what I want? A daytime talker. You know what I want to do? I want to instruct people how to live their lives because I'm doing it better than everybody. Yeah. And I'd love to get two people on stage and tell them that their shit is fucked and then turn to the camera and take a break. We'll be right back. <laughs> yeah. So you, you know? so you find yourself in that situation. You yeah. found yourself in that situation. A couple of times. And, and people that were producing this thing, they wanted you to be an expert. They want you to be an expert and, and they're allowed to want that because you've taken their money. Yeah. You've taken their money. They've said, we want this and you say, okay, well, let's well, kind of, you know, and then you've, so, and, and that's just that, and you learn that lesson. The, like, you know, it, like, sometimes people are very good at talking you into what they think you can do and you have a hard time not hearing them. They're like, no, you're great at this. Yeah. It's going to be amazing. Even though in your heart of hearts, you're like, but I don't want to do that. I don't want to, I'm barely, I'm, I'm barely, I have enough of my own problems to be standing in front of other people. I, I don't mind writing it down in a book. I don't mind saying, here's how I feel. Do what you will with it. Yeah. But just to point the finger at somebody and say, this is how you must do things, that feels just, that doesn't work for me because I don't believe that. Well, and it's, and it's uh, you know, and, and, and so you're in, a, you're in a quandary here. Yeah. And, and not But I love the check. And do you know what I'm going to buy? <laughs> Pence and jackets. Can you believe the guitar I have? We're like, sure. I mean, that's the, that, and that is, and I'm sure there's lots of people who have made that choice in their lives. You've got kids, you've got an agenda, you've got things you're doing. This is the check. You figure, shit. At the very least, the kids will go to school. Yeah. Right? Sure. You know, I sure. mean, that is, but that is, does not make great art. Well, no, it doesn't, make, it doesn't make great art, and oftentimes people who host shows are not, not only don't they want to be hosts, they're actually known for something else. They have That's proficiency right. in some other That's area, right. and now they want to, and this is the thing that I have, you know, that, that, that I have never seen on television that I, I kind of aspire to is, is hosting something where you're flawed. The host is actually flawed. Right. And... It's a show that helps people. Well, that's, we, we got to that point. The one kind of cool thing was in the, uh, 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 my buddy Dave, who was a writer on the show, who wrote, how about later? Yeah. Dave Anthony. We got to the point in the show where I, I said, look, 
let me say I'm an alcoholic and a failure and a mistake and a disaster. And I love, but I love talking and I love hearing what other people, I, I love talking about people's problems. But give me a therapist. Put a Stacy Kaiser there and let her do the tough stuff while I pick out a tie. Right. But I'm gonna, because I love the chat. I love to hear about, I do like people's problems. I find them fascinating sure. and I like talking about them and I, and I am good at talking about them. Yeah. However, I don't want to, I want somebody else to administer the punishment. Mm -hmm. I want somebody else to go, then you need to get your ass to blah, da, blah, blah. And I'm like, absolutely. When we come back, we do a makeover. <laughs> yeah. you know? And then we do a makeover, because those I believe in, because you see actual change. Yeah. Makeovers, <laughs> makeovers will actually change people more than chatting with them and telling them what to do. You uh -oh. put somebody in a new jacket, and suddenly they want to be married again. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? You know what? I'm gonna go home and try on every jacket I have. I put on something new. What, what, now you, so you go into, uh, but you, but that's another thing. You have a love of cl clothing I have style. A, I love. I have a love of, of, yeah, because I believe in the power of clothing, and I actually believe that that if you, when you find the right thing to wear, you you are become a different person. And as much therapy as I've done, and you know, self help investigating all that kind of stuff, and I, you know, uh, you know my, uh, you know my, my my programs that I go to to keep myself sane. I found that sometimes it's just a, a, a maroon double cardi, which is a cardigan and then a cardigan <laughs> under it, makes me just as happy, if not more confident. And uh, and yeah. uh, and I do believe there is sort of a, a power in dressing yourself. I well, I have figured out, and I'm going to start doing this. I figured out that the best dressed people to me in the world, like powerful power dressing, mm -hmm. is from dictators. I think that dictators, <laughs> they seem when to... I see a Gaddafi. I'm thinking, you know what? Not a nice man. Not at but all. Very powerful dresser. You know who designed the uh, uniforms for the SS? Hugo Boss. <laughs> I'm not even kidding. <laughs> is that true? The, the, I believe that is the truth. Oh my God. You know what I mean? So, oh my God. You know, the people respond to tailoring. <laughs> they do they respond. respond. They respond to they respond to sharp shoulders and tight <laughs> single the needle the, tailoring. The, the tighter the clothes, the leaner the meaner, the the, the, the more people respond. Kim Jong Il, but very I, good. But I do yeah. think that there is he, he puts it, he'll put it together, and yeah. he's a softer fella. <laughs> they um I do feel that that it is like an armor sometimes, um, but there the, you, even on a superficial level sometimes that's all you need to to, to tease yourself into feeling better. So you you design you design. So clothes I've been now? learning how to design clothes. I've been like just basically I'll take two things that I like and then I'll get together with my partner Kelly and we'll make a pa we'll get a pattern made and then we'll get some fabrics and we'll have somebody sew us a pair of pants and we'll go yes no yes and we'll make another pair. Wow. And we'll just keep doing it till we figure out what it is exactly that uh, that we're, we we want to do. That's and then I'll wear them on stage or I'll take them with me somewhere, you know? So I just because uh I think, you know, in life sometimes you just have to start doing it. You can't yeah. wait. I can't wait. I can't go back to college. I don't have the time to go to the Fashion Institute, but I'd love to just, so you just go do it. Act taking a leap. A, act, taking, take, take a leap. Taking a leap. Start, start, you know, I think Coppola was talking about this, about making movies. He would just start making them. Right. He would just start putting the wheels in motion. He didn't have the funding. He didn't have to just start making a movie. I'm going to start making it. Start getting the script together and putting well, people together. And I think sometimes, you know, well, especially now with the internet. Yeah. There's just no excuse. And there is no excuse. And I think that's, I think that's the template to doing things. You, you envision what you want to do, and then you don't have the paycheck, but you actually can do it. If you think about all the jobs, like, look, if you want to be a brain surgeon, you can't simulate that, no. although some people have tried. Mm -mm. But, but no, you can really, you know, you want, to have a, you want to have a production company, start with ideas and yeah. start doing things. Right. But I mean, even have meetings. Be, maybe you want to be a brain surgeon, start reading about medicine and figure out where you sure. can go to college. To, like, you can start doing, you can start you, taking the little steps to get there. Be in action. To, 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 to make it happen. And then, you know, you've got a friend, and, or maybe there's a guy, he's a bum. You know, try a little surgery on him. He doesn't know. He's asleep. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, sometimes you got to do a little back alley this and a little back alley that to get, you know, to get your chops. Look, but you do it. Right? Medicine is not a science. It's <clears throat> an art. It is an art form. It's not a me it's not science. Look, it's punk rock. And, 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 and in the old days when the punk started, the, the big credo was you don't have to know how to play. You know, we're learning that now with podcasting. Essentially, people are saying, you know what? You don't have to know how to do radio. Now that means there's going to be a lot of terrible podcasts. Oh, yeah. But the things that come out of it that are going to be great, those people, if someone had tried to develop them, would have wrecked it. The, the, the <clears> beauty <throat> of the internet is you don't have to ask permission. I don't need to check with anybody. I don't need to run this by standards and practices. Mm -hmm. I don't have to do that. I'm just going to go ahead and do it and see where it lays. You know, there's people that are like, well, if I'd ever been given a shot, well, take a shot. Yeah. Because they, people can see you on the internet, and if you're interesting enough, they'll, they'll come check it out. Indep there's independent film. 
That's now right. there's independent radio and video. That's right. There's, it, this is an independent thing. Yeah. Um, to me, I actually feel like, you know, I see some podcasts uh, or hear them, and I, I feel like they should be, you know, I want them to be broadcast. Well, let me tell you something right now, because <clears throat> I don't know if a lot of your fans know this, but your performance on Mark Maron's uh, WTF oh, yeah. is the funniest the funniest episode of that show. Now, Mark is an amazing interviewer, he, but it's not often meant to be a, sh a funny show. It's yeah. a very invest, you know, it's a very personal inside comedy thing, and it can be very, very funny. But you on that show, on, off the, Marin is crying listening to you. Well, it's you are on fire. So if you are a fan of Ed's, or even if you're not, go find uh, that episode of uh, Marin. Have you had him on the show here? I've tried. He do not go on the show. Is that right? But I'm going to try it's to have him. It's an awfully on. fancy for a guy with a podcast. Oh, I understand. No, really. <clears throat> you do you yeah. know how he brought me up? This is how he brought me up on the show. He said, This guy is fucking hilarious. I don't know. Where, I, don't, I haven't heard of I don't know what the hell he's doing. I haven't heard of him. Yeah. I don't even remember how I know him. <laughs> He literally said that. He said, I don't remember how I know him, and I didn't even realize he was still around, was the, was the intro. Yes, I heard that. <laughs> and it was like... But whatever what? it did, it put a fire under your ass because you were funny as shit on there. And, oh, and, but that's, I mean, look, he's, he, Dave and I talk about this on our podcast this week, but he's a guy that people w couldn't, didn't hire, wouldn't hire, liked him, right. loved his comedy. Right. Everyone respected him, but his, he just, they couldn't find a place for him, so Mark hired himself. I mean, that's essentially what a podcast is. I've just hired myself to do a radio show. <laughs> right. I've just, or in, in our case, Dave hired me because I didn't want to do a podcast because there were already two being done. And I was like, that's enough. <laughs> I listen to Pardo's. I listen to Marin's. I'm, I'm done. That's I don't it. need to do any more. Yeah. And Dave was like, no, we could, we, we could do something different. Well, that's fantastic because I've lis I listened to the, and I, as I told you before, um, we're going to have Dave come out in just a minute. But I, uh, it's two guys. The relationship between you two is two buddies who are six years old. <laughs> That's what it is. You're six years old, and then you allow that to happen, and then you become adults. Right. At some point right. in the podcast, adults right. and music. But you're really six. You're yeah. six-year-old kids, yeah. and you're in a closet. Yes. So we do it in a closet. It's juvenile. It's um, it can sometimes get it can sometimes be so filthy that I'm not sure I'm a good person anymore. <laughs> I've actually said if you're listening to this, you are no longer a good person because <laughs> what we've all been a part of this last few moments is so dirty and vile. Yeah. Um, but the other thing that's cool about it, and the thing I, the thing that I like about it, and I think as an artist, I now have no excuse about why people don't get me. I can't say, well, you don't know the real me, because there it is, in living color, and, and I have this vehicle for myself where I can do exactly what I want to do, the way I want to do it. I don't have to worry about network notes. I don't have to worry about anybody else's version of it. And now I can't complain, because I've got it. And if people like that, then I win. If they don't, there you go. But I also, it makes, me, it makes all my other work easier because when I go to do something else now, I'm like, well, this isn't about me. If you want it to be about you, go shout in the closet with your sad friend. <laughs> all right, yeah. do that, but do that. But, it, but this isn't about you now. This is about somebody else's job or somebody else's show or some other version of you that we're using to do this particular thing. But you have experience, you know, like really being fully yourself. You have yeah. that experience. I cannot tell you how much better it's made me feel like as a performer where I go, look, this is exactly who I am. And the reason I feel that way is because I'm with somebody else who I think is funnier than me and allows me to kick back. I don't. It's not about. I don't have to be the fucking guy. I, it's not the Greg Barron thing. It's fucking walk in the room and I'm there with this. I mean, look. Let's be real. Dave is a tragic, tragic dude. Mm. And if it wasn't for me in the closet, well, we'd have you and I had gone to a funeral a couple of months back. Sure. But we didn't. We stayed there <laughs> in the closet. We made it happen. You gave a man a vehicle to live. He uh, and he gave me a vehicle to live. Yeah. So it's you know. Well, I, I you know Tom Kenny was here uh, last week or a couple of weeks ago and he he. He's, he's so clear, and he lives on. He lives near you. He lives right down the street. I've had your whole street on, by the way. I've I, had Jeff Sherman, yeah. Wendy Liebman, Tom Kenny, Mike Rowe, oh, it's a, you. That's awesome. That's, I'm, I think that's everybody. Clem Burke is my neighbor, the drummer from Blondie. <laughs> Let's see if you can get him down here for a chat about what was it like Whatever. at 54? <laughs> how, how is Debbie Harry? It's 54. <laughs> the tide is high, but I'm holding on. I'll tell you that right now. Oh, my God. I'm holding on. No, I, I, he is, too, to a, to a hair color I don't believe is natural, <laughs> and yet has his, and yet, and he just bought himself a, a, a a muscle car, I love him. He's a nice guy. He's a nice guy. A little bit insane, but nice guy. Well, you have uh, Vicky. What's going on in the chat room? We have some questions for Greg, and then we're going to go to Dave. We got to yeah, bring no, Dave on. I'm just saying we got to get Dave on, like. Right okay, cool. <laughs> let's get Dave on. Uh, let's. We're going to play a clip from the podcast. We're going to play play a clip for you, and then we're going to welcome uh, Dave Anthony, who is also in the closet. Check right. it out. We're not troubled then by five dollars a gallon. 
Of course I'm troubled, but it seems a little excessive when it costs twice that in some countries. And I think these oil companies are heroes. Think what it takes to bring this stuff to us across an ocean, refine it into three types of gasoline, put it in trucks that cost $100,000 each, ship that to gasoline stations that have to have all this equipment, so expensive equipment, so we don't blow ourselves up pumping our own gas. It still costs less per ounce than the bottled water they sell at some of these gas stations. John Stossel makes a really good point. Oil companies are heroes, but they're not the only heroes, and I'd like to thank the rest of them. I'd like to thank the guys who made this knife. They put a handle on one end instead of having two blades. That way when I cut food, I don't cut my fingers off at the same time. <laughs> Man, you guys are heroes. I'd like to uh, thank the guys who made this door. Wow. Look at that. When I close it, the roof doesn't cave in and the walls don't all fall down and kill me. You guys are heroes. Oh, man. That could have exploded and killed me. You know why it didn't? Heroes made it. Oh man, my car didn't blow up. Ha <laughs> ha, heroes! Woo, heroes! Woo! I'd like to thank the guys who make milk. I mean, they, first they take it out of cows, and, and, then they, and then they put it in containers and they ship it, and nobody dies. And, and then they put it in these things, which, I mean, how do you do that? You know, and they, they put a hole in the top so you can get it out so you don't have to dig out with your teeth or, or tear the top off. And, and there's a bottom. I mean, you know, these guys are heroes. And uh, then some guy made a glass to put the fucking milk in. I'm sorry, it's just so emotional. Turn it off. Turn off even though I'm the only guy here. Turn off. That's amazing. That's the amazing Dave Anthony. And here he is joining us now. Mr. Dave Anthony, everybody. Hi. Pleasure to have you, man. Hi. Um, Hi. You guys are in a closet Sit together. Sit closer. Yeah. Sit closer. What the hell is yeah, going yeah, on with... What, what, how can you... You have a friendship that I, I admire so much, you guys. Because what? you can say things that you probably can't say to anybody else. No, I agree. We, we've... I hate... The first time I went on stage... I did a set. I watched the comics, and you know it was like Margaret Cho and Tony Kameen and all these guys, sure. other guys we know. Sure. And uh, and I did my set, and I was terrified. I just read it off the page. Uh, I don't think anybody laughed at me. And then maybe Greg did, and Greg was sitting at the bar, and he came over and said, uh, "You're funny. You should keep doing this. Here's a list of uh, of places to go." And then we were just friends after that. So it's pretty amazing that yeah. he was there the first time I went on stage. Like that's. That's a big thing. However, on that list be. was uh, the Limited Express Clothing Store, <laughs> uh, a Mexican restaurant that I used yeah. to work at, yeah. Uh, yeah. at my grandma's house. Yeah, yeah. but trying to help, but it, trying to help. Yeah, no, try. but you know, like, yeah. I'm sure this has happened to you, where you there's just people that, like, you... you Comedy is in a whole lot different than music, where you see someone and you go, I like the sound of, I like the way, when you're talking, yeah. I'm interested. I don't yeah. even know that it needs to end in a punchline, and, uh, and as, as evidenced by that tape, it's, Dave's fucking hilarious. It's the person, though. It's, it's the person. It is the yeah. person, but it's something that we do. I, I agree, and Mark Marin says this, we are a tribe of people, yeah. and when we see someone, we go, that guy's one of us. We go out of our way to encourage that person. Yeah. You that, just, you sense it. It's kind of unusual. It's a little bit unusual. I don't know if it's that way in the other, maybe it is in, in every art, but I always felt like comics were, you know, you really go out for the other people. Yeah. Like if you, and, and that's really the feeling you have. One, mm -hmm. If you see a second of somebody on stage and inspires you, they're, they're in your memory yeah. and in your soul for life. Yeah. That's how it is. And to be honest too, like people, like you did that for me, I used to watch, Janine Garofalo was amazing at grabbing people like Mary Lynn Rice Cub, like Margaret Cho, like Laura Milligan, like Karen Kilgariff, like she 
grabbed people and put them in front of, like when she had the power to do so, she would recommend everybody, generally, yeah. and men and women. I mean, she really was just good at that. And I think you watch people do that and you realize, oh, that's what I'm supposed to do. It's okay. Nobody's gonna, look, look at David. He's not gonna take anything away from me. What am mm. I afraid of? <laughs> no, <laughs> I don't want to. Right, because <laughs> what do I have that you want? Not Nothing. <laughs> These abdominal muscles. There's yeah, he's got abs of steel. He has abs of steel. There's nothing there. I will fucking, I will, like, is, I will fucking reach right zone. in here. Do you know? How, do you know how soft this is? <laughs> oh, so soft. Boof! <laughs> and then I can just pull it out <laughs> and eat it. This is the softest area known to man. Except for that, it's made of hate. <laughs> so I would eat a black it's, heart, and then I would get sick. It's made of hate. Yeah. yeah. What What is it that the? You know how how when you guys are doing the podcast, like what do you say to each other? Do you say okay? Let's just let's go. And today I'm going to pull out your esophagus. That, what that do just you say? Happens, that happens naturally, and that isn't. We're <laughs> we're literally expressing our frustration with each other when when those moments aren't like, hey, let's just do a thing where we don't. No, it's literally like I I want to right now punch you in the face. Like I would very much yeah. like. Sometimes it's a, it, there, it, there's an affection to it. It's like Dave will say something, and you go, "That's such classic Dave." That what I what I what I want what I want is a butterfly knife to split him open and then wear him like a coat, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, but at the same time, at the same time, I think people, uh, I think people get that from the podcast too. I'm a, I'm a huge fan and I also, I'm interested in Finn and his marriage and his career woes and his, you know, Dave reacts to things differently than I do and I find that fascinating, Dave's reaction to uh, a Kim Kardashian um, uh, <laughs> who he despises and yet didn't oh. know who she was until I explained to him who she was. <laughs> I hate this person. It's I a pre despising I, I, I was the one that hipped him to the fact that she'd been in a, it, that she'd made a, a, a sex Porno. tape. Yeah. He just hated her. Yeah. I hate it. <laughs> I just, yeah, I hate her because what she represents. I hate her because I would watch her tweet. Someone said, you got to look at her tweets. Yeah. And she's so vacuous and has no idea of the suffering that's going on in the country right now economically yeah. that it's insane to me. It's literally like, <clears throat> she's like Marie Antoinette just sitting up there eating cake, even though she probably never actually said that. But, you know, she has no idea that people are groveling in the mud. And she's like, look at the new capes I got. And you're like, Fuck capes! <laughs> yeah. How can I you not drive to where you are and kill you? They, they, they were good. They are pretty. The capes are pretty awesome. I, I, you like the capes? I'm not gonna let you. I bought one. I mean, <laughs> when a... Kardashian says jump, I say hell high. <laughs> what, what bag are we getting this weekend, pumpkin? <laughs> well, I don't want a Balenciaga <laughs> bag, but I know that I could. I know I can what, wear one. What bag are we getting, pumpkin? That's the thing that I love. <laughs> right? Not even the bag, but pumpkin. Yeah. Is now, that, D Dave, we're gonna go to some questions in just a minute, but but um, you know. Perfect job for you. Like, give me the scenario for you. What do you want to be doing? If what I do, what do you do? No, I, or or, or in entertainment. This, within this. Either way, what do you do? You get up in the morning. Yeah, why don't you describe your perfect I, day to me? I have, well, I can tell you, I've never in my life wanted to be anything but a stand up. Okay. So that's my perfect job. Okay. L literally. Sadly, it's, it's, it's very difficult for me now because, of, because I have a child. Yeah. Uh, and who I take care of. It's not. It's not one of those. Like it's so funny because I've talked to other comedians. Like, well, yeah, you get the nanny. He had it no, with there's a bear. There's no nanny. <laughs> yeah, it's a bear. It's a small. Bear. A baby bear. A cub. We didn't know that was uh, yeah. how it was going to come out. Well, you did when you fucked that bear. Oh, yeah, I did fuck a bear. <laughs> but you bears know, are hot. Yeah, they're hot. Yeah. Am I wrong? Yeah, not at all. You're not wrong. Um, but but now you have you're juggling this thing. You have this beautiful little boy, mm -hmm. your son Finnegan. Yeah. Finnegan, I love him. He's great. He's very funny, yeah. but it's so funny because as a, as a young comic, I, uh, I never enjoyed comedy about kids. So I have it ingrained in me not to do comedy about kids. Ah. So it's a very difficult thing to approach that for, for me. Mm -hmm. And I see a guy like Louis C.K. do it very well. Yes. Um, and I, I have a, almost a sort of similar sensibility to Louis in a way. So then I really don't want to do it because I'm like, well, that guy did it mm -hmm. really great. But yeah. I remember watching, like, I just I just sent a message to Clark Taylor the other day going, I didn't Clark get Taylor. I didn't get your <clears throat> kid comedy until now. Yeah. I didn't get it. Yeah. yeah. And now I get it. But I also, I, I, I would like to do it, but I would also like to do the sort of alternative rooms, and they don't want to hear it. They're young. Yeah. I was on stage the other night, and they said, how many of you guys have a kid? But then that becomes your thing, right? Then you come out and yeah. you say, how many guys, well, uh, here's the yeah, old guy. Here comes out. the old guy now. Right, exactly. I'm a parent, I could be your parent. Yeah. You know, 
Because what you, you don't strike me as the kind of, I mean, you're going to use your life. I am. You're not going to be, you know. I don't, I, I've stopped talking. I, I went, it was so funny, I went on stage a couple months ago and I tried to do some observational comedy, just dying, and I just started laughing and the audience started laughing because it was so clear it's not my thing. Yeah. And I just started, and then I started reading them off the list that I pulled out of my pocket and going, check out what I was going to do with this one. Oh, and hilarious. now everyone's just having a good time because it's like, that's not who you are. I have to talk about my experiences, what happens in my life. Yeah. And I've always tried to tap into some dark shit, but I have a very dark background with my dad, alcoholic and all this stuff. So when I try to go there, audiences usually get freaked out. I'm sure yeah. you've had that experience. Oh, oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. But my favorite thing is that moment. You know, I did a, I did a one man show, and I did some of these things, and I did the, some of the alternative rooms. My favorite thing is going to a really dark place, knowing that it's going to flip over. Yeah. And that moment in that that silence before it flips over. Yeah. Because it's like, what, however long the silence is, that's how long the laugh is going to be. The difference between mm. me and you on that one is, I don't know it's going to flip over. Yeah. I generally think, oh, well, I've just, this is, I'm yeah, I mean, with David's it. not going to flip over. <laughs> gonna, what Dave's going to do is he's going to take you deep, and then he's going to hand you a shovel. See if, you can, if you can both, if we can all yeah. go lower as a group. There's, no there's no delicious candy at the end of his journey. No, the rewards no. Are, are below, yeah, the rewards are more arsenic. Yeah, absolutely. That's your, going to be your reward yeah, to, yeah. to quench there's no question. It's also I want to. I want to go to some. Qu I think we have some questions for both oh, of you, maybe. We do. Well, mm. Okay. Uh, typically, we take questions from the chat room or Twitter uh, from fans, but you guys are a part of something groundbreaking. It's a brand new segment on the show, called Celebrity Questions. Oh, we and this be week, here. oh my God, the celebrity that has questions for you is oh. Mr. Patton Oswalt. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic so, idea. So oh, no. I'm sure you know where this is going already. Yeah. Here we go, fellas. Number one, do you get upset when people describe walking the room as a cry for help when it's so clearly a slow motion audio suicide note? <laughs> <laughs> it's an audio suicide note. Patton Oswald, audio suicide note. How do you answer that one? Patton, uh, uh, among be uh, besides being a uh, uh, you Support. know kind of a superstar and a, yeah, uh, also runs our publicity department. So <laughs> is, uh, and he's not doing the best job. He's not doing the best and job. And yet you cannot argue with the accuracy. Uh, <laughs> I have described for people the show, I told the one uh, person we, who interviewed us that it's like the beginning of Mad Men uh, where it's two guys falling uh, <laughs> to an untimely death. And, uh, but their, sil the but their silhouettes are far less appealing yeah. uh, uh, than Don, uh, Don Draper. We, don't, well, know, one we don't know when the payment's going to come. We don't. Wow. It's just Quicker, though. The, well, we're falling faster than he is. He's got a nice. Fast. He's having a nice sort of a slow motion it's a drop. Slow thing. Yeah. This yeah. podcast could have never happened years ago. It's perfect now because of our ages. Yeah. Okay. It would have never worked years ago. Right. Well, audio suicide note. I like. I, I mean, I think that's going to be a band name. I have a feeling. <laughs> audio suicide note is going to spin into a band. Yeah. And I, I, I have to say that uh, you know. The podcasting allows you, like Greg was saying earlier, to be who you are. You can be who you are, and you can you can podcast. I, I say it's like it's like punk rock. It's like the Ramones. Like for comedy, that's what it is. We get to do whatever we want. Finally, yeah. Finally, I saw Larry Miller uh, a couple weeks ago, and he was like, "I'm doing a podcast. I get to say whatever I want." Finally, like we guys who have been chained for years get to do what they want. Well, just because you couldn't find a venue in which you could do it besides your stand-up, mm. and that's so far and few <clears> between, and people can. I mean, the cool thing about us is that like we have a we have almost, we have a we have fans in Australia and in China. Uh, we have them all over the world, and. And we wouldn't otherwise. You know what I mean? We wouldn't yeah. otherwise. Sure. Yeah. And when I say fans, what I'm talking about is cons people that are concerned, concerned or cryptic and are waiting for our <laughs> slow uh, uh, deaths. They're concerned. We have uh, Patton is concerned. Now yes. we have someone else. Oh. I'm just going to knock them out one after the other because yeah. they, they're pretty much all of the same answer, yeah, 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 I would yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, number two from Patton Oswalt. When will you add nylon filters over the microphone to mute the sound of Dave's man boobs slapping whenever he speaks? <laughs> yeah, that's that's, I'm, I'm concerned about that a little bit. I have two answers, never well, on Tuesday. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the way we're going with that. Yeah. I can't, you can't, there's, we can't try to contain the man boobs, they're just gonna happen. By the way, mm -hmm. I don't know about your show, but whenever Patton uh, tweets about us, we get 600 new fans. We lose 800. <laughs> that's, that's, that's a it's, it's a good feeling and a bad yeah. feeling. And yeah. left with a bad feeling. Yeah. Thank you, Patton. 
I, I put on a t-shirt tonight, and then I took it off and put this on because there was too much happening upstairs. <laughs> yeah, you went with a dark color. You're, yeah. you're There's a lot happening upstairs. Mr. Upstairs and Mr. Downstairs <laughs> sometimes don't communicate. <laughs> they don't. All right. I'm an unwilling tranny. <laughs> this week in comedy has actual fans. Does this make you uncomfortable? <laughs> uh, <laughs> pudding. <laughs> yeah. It's certainly, like knowing someone's actually listening yeah, is not mm -hmm. good. I like the use of the you. word has because after this segment, they <laughs> may not. <laughs> in the past, in the past. Yeah. No, I don't know who the, you know, for, for a while we were the number one podcast in South Africa. I'm not kidding. And I don't know what you people are sm No. Um, <laughs> I thank you again, Vuvuzela. There you go. I love we it. have fans in South Africa too. There you go. Oddly, yeah. Maybe the same ones. Yeah. Could be. Same guys. Same guy. Yeah. Greg's only interests are candy and exercise. Not a question, but an observation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, this is clothes. my favorite. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. My friend says walking the room is the podcast <laughs> is the podcast equivalent of Willem Dafoe's death in Platoon, and <laughs> I say it's the podcast equivalent of Deborah Winger's death in terms of endearment. <laughs> Who's right? It's definitely not Platoon. That's way too quick. Yeah. <laughs> Deborah Winger's slow. It's uh, slow, and 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 Dafoe was more dramatic, and there were people watching. <clears throat> Yeah. Ours is going to be uh, just at the end. What I like is family I around. like Deborah Winger running across a field being shot so, much so many times. <laughs> so much better. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? As a cure for cancer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's cured by cancer. Boom. They and they're going to shoot, shoot it out of her. Laetril. You know who's doing yeah. that? Dwayne Johnson is shooting the cancer right out of her. Yeah. Uh, I love it. <laughs> He's a healer. I love He's not rock. a wrestler. He's oh, a healer. No, yeah. he is a healer. He's an actor. He's a healer. Yeah. No, but that's really true. Deborah Wing. Now, I heard a story. I don't know if this is true. And I'm sure she's a great actress. She's probably a wonderful person. People change. They evolve. Yeah. But a friend of mine did, a, did an audition with her and said, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Winger, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of yours. And she looked back at him and she said, Ms. Winger, I'm a huge fan of yours. So there's a certain kind of person. <laughs> My God, she'd be perfect That's on our podcast. <laughs> she'd be, if one of us should could, ever be sick, you could, the, uh, she could come sit could, in the room with you, us you, you could, and just mock you. You could, you could take her Welcome tonsils to and rip them through her nasal oh, passage. I, I would strangle her. Wow. I would strangle her with her bra, but before that, I'd let her go. Welcome to my king you in Greg Parent. Oh, really? Is that how it's going to go, Deborah? <laughs> oh, I'm sure. Listen, everybody has their moments. She's you know jealous because Dave's tits are bigger than hers. Well, that's what. And there's no windscreen for that. There's no protection no. for that. Mm -mm. Okay. His last question was just a real simple uh, why, why does his pee hurt? That's, we're just going to end on that. I'm going to do a separate episode that's, on that. That's, that's a, a whole, whole separate episode. Situation. And by the way, Pat Oswald, I'm going to speak directly to you now. Wow. And that is, if you can do The Day the Clown Cried at a 50-seat theater, you can come on This is this Week in Comedy. That's mm -hmm. what you can do. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, if you can do The Day the Clown Cried all over the country, yeah. you can come on This Week in Comedy. I, I love you. We saw It's a Wonderful Life together. We've seen movies. Yeah. Come on the show. There you come go. on the show. Come on the show. I remember a day, I remember <clears throat> the days when we first started uh, down here in Los Angeles, because we all moved down here around the, uh, a bunch of us moved down here around the same time. And uh, it was, uh, we, a bunch of us went to, because nobody did anything. You know, in the old days, there was no internet, there was nothing to do. Right. So we all would go to movies together, and we would go in a group, and one time, I think it was, we were close to 30 people, yeah. went to see Speed. I was there. And in that group <clears throat> was Dave Anthony, and Patton Oswalt, and Moon Zappa, and Quentin Tarantino, yeah. and Kathy Griffin, and mm. Margaret, Ch like it was an emo, and, <laughs> and it's funny to think about it now that we just all had nothing to do. There was no, there was maybe an open mic later on that night, yeah. and there was, now, if you're not making something, you're not, you know what I mean? Like, the, there's no excuse, there's no time off. Yeah. If you're a young comedian, you're yeah. making something, you're in a fucking improv class at UCB. You, I mean, that's the other thing about it. Now, people are working, because every second you take off, somebody else is succeeding. You know what I mean? I mean, there are Street. jets shooting off. Like, you're sitting there, and, and Aziz and Zari just fucking shoots out of his chair. <laughs> you were sitting next to him, and he, poof, and that's it. He's, he's gone. In a, he's in a 4,000... Uh, seat theater, uh, just just mm -hmm. waiting to go into a twenty seat thousand theater. It's the it's power of media. It's, it's the power. It's a different kind of media. Now yeah. I was just thinking about you know the days when we'd call in to get spots. Yep. There were no cell phones. Yeah. Right. So you're on the phone trying to get on a Cobbs with Tom Sawyer, and there's a window of thirty seconds. Literally, if you don't get literally. in, you don't work. At 3 p.m. You don't work. 3 yeah. p.m. Yeah. on you Monday. Don't, you don't I think. Get to set that. Yeah. And you don't work. Yeah. yeah. So it's a different. There's so much access now. But you guys did, you guys were always trying to do stuff like, you were always doing one-man shows. Yep. Psychobilly Freakout. 
Like you guys were trying to do different stuff. Yeah. Right. We were trying to. I think. I think. I think you 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 start to think. Well, how can I make this different? How can I make this experience you know more interesting? Or you know who can I pull together and. You know. And also, how can I be my, you know, I always said to, to comedians like down here, I, you know, everybody, I got to get on at the improv. I got to get a good spot. I'll get a good spot at the improv. I got to get on at the improv. I said, you know what? The improv is a venue. You're the show. Mm -hmm. Improv is a venue. That's right. Get a venue yeah. and invite people. Yeah. You're just as good, better, because you don't have to spend your time trying to learn how to, how to survive yeah. the stage. Yeah. You can be you on a stage. And learn what that feels like. Well, and I also think that the, you know something happened uh, maybe five six years ago when when Patton and Brian and and Zach and Maria Bamford said I'm gonna we're just gonna skip the comedy club thing altogether and we're gonna go and David Cross I we're gonna up go one of those. yeah we're gonna yeah. put it in a rock and roll show and we're not gonna do we're not gonna do the comedy club thing now, I don't think there's anything wrong with the comedy club but I do admire the I don't want to work during and have chicken wings served and do five show and like. You know, I think that there, there's a, there's always that ingenuity in comedy. People are always trying to figure it out. There's a guy I don't even know his name. <clears throat> he does a show back in uh, at the UCB Theater, and he'll do things like uh, he's he's taking a bus of comics across the country and he's performing in people's yards and shooting oh, the whole thing. That's fantastic. He's just doing stand up. Well, fantastic. we are we are finding a way to get rid of the system. And work around it, and it's working fantastically. Well, here's is what I'm what I'm what I'm hoping though as well is that there's some kind of you know there used to be a United Artists they they started a film company and that the idea was to was to have a community do something creative and to help others and do this thing. I mean, <clears throat> to me, I'm I'm hoping that in, in one day television, television the box will get bigger. Oh, People will. will make the box bigger as opposed to trying to fit in the box. Right. <laughs> the box has mm -hmm. been the same size the whole time. Yeah. And, and every comedian in the world has tried to get in it. Yeah. Well, you gotta make a bigger box. Well, you have to make it a, an experience. You're watching that change now. Louis' show, Louis oh, C.K.'s oh, show, fantastic. is like watching art. It's like watching art on television. That show would have never happened just five years ago. I don't think they would have gone, yeah, go for it. Well, because, I think because there's so many things out there to watch now that you can do something more unique on those channels, and it's going to just expand. Like with Google TV, when you can just start watching anything online and everyone's doing it, it you're going to see a lot of stuff pop up. Well, the more full a human being that you can be in whatever you do, the better chance you have to bring that to a different medium. I disagree. Yeah, I, you shouldn't be a full human being. Well, that's, I mean, that's, you should be and one dimensional. Right. Well, that works a lot. Right. Well, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> right. But that, you know, that's, that, that's the interesting thing is that in, with this, this yeah. podcast that we've been doing, and this is genuinely true, that, that for, for the first time in my comedy career, for the first time in my comedy career, um, the response from the people that listen to it, and mm. as tragic as they may be, has been overwhelming in terms of their. Mm. Um, paying attention, um, sending in gifts, making t-shirts, wanting to be involved, writing us in between episodes and waiting for the next one. Like, it's just genuine. And Dave and I really uh, genuinely did not try and do anything but spend time together. Yeah. Like, the real premise of this was, you know, it was like, oh, we should do a podcast together. We were just literally had neglected our friendship for so long, and the only way we could get together with families was to work. Yeah. And so we tell our wives that we're working, and we go sit in the closet at my place because yeah. it soaks up the sound, and we have our friendship on the radio every week. Yeah. And it's, we weren't, like... Our, like somebody said, well, what do you? What's next? What's your expectations? Fuck! If we could tour, yeah, that's it. If we could that's take it. it live to your uh, local gym, like if we could fill a room of five hundred people, if we could do a small theater, if we could do something like that and take it out there and have the lo a local kid open the show, yeah, yeah. and do something <clears throat> like that, that would be enough. I don't need it to be anything yeah. more than that other than more more spreading of that of this kind of joy we're having. But it's really interesting how that personal aspect of it. I think, you know, people laugh about the threatening to kill each other, but I think they stay because they think, "Oh, Dave seems like a nice dad." <laughs> and how sad is it that he has to spend time with Greg? There's a yeah. sympathy for Dave that makes people Well, you know what they get? They get that you guys are genuine friends. That's what they get. On some level, they get that you're genuine friends because gen nobody could talk to each other like that unless they were genuinely friends. Mm -hmm. And that yeah. actually resonates. That creates a community. It really does. You know, you're mm -hmm. talking about, s these are simple, basic things. Right. But they're enormous in right. a culture that has been asleep for many years. In, yes. a in a world where people are struggling 
when they see friends, they're like, oh, those guys are, oh, may, hey, I can wake up now. Hey, I'm a human being. Hey, right. I have friends. Right, and I, I do like what you're saying about that idea of a community where it's, you know, we, we, we have our little, our 10 posts, the things that we talk about, candy and, and working out and beating each other up in our families. But there are these things that other people relate to and, they, and we come together under that, you know, un under that uh, tent and we talk about those things and it is this weird, it is community on some level because, you know, uh, uh, that's all people ever want to hear is pieces of their lives or lives that they, you know, thrown back at them. Yeah, well, that, you know? well, that's what sustains you. That's what sustains us. You know, as, as performers, it sustains you, but yeah. as people. If you, you move to L.A. to be in show business, if you move here to work, Mm -hmm. you're sadly disappointed yeah. because then you have to realize I need everything that I needed when I came from Minnesota. I need yeah. friends. I need community. These are the things that sustain you. Yep. And, and you know, I, I'm sorry that we're, we're running out of time here, but I, um, you got to come back. You have to come back because there's a bunch of things that I want to talk to you about. I've been listening to the podcast. I love it. Uh, Walking the Room, uh, Greg Barron and Dave Anthony. Uh, look, for bring, look for Bring the Rock. Bring the Rock, yeah, I think there'll be one. There was going to be one in December. I don't think that's happening now, but there will be one in the new year. This is for you. Oh, thank there you, you so much. Oh, I love it. And the Reigning Monarchs uh, now. Uh, Record for free, reigningmonarchs.com. Just give us your email that I've, we'll never use. And I've you get never it for done free. Bring the Rock also. Isn't that interesting? It is interesting. Isn't that interesting? Maybe that's something you can talk about in the closet. Isn't that it's weird? like creeping death. <laughs> <laughs> it's like my leg just went dead, and suddenly I can feel the poison go into my head. Look for it's a slow poison. Um, Dave, anything you wanna you wanna tell us? Anything uh, you wanna do? Anything you're gonna? What do you wanna do? What with my life? Yeah. Uh, I I wanna I wanna be a stand up again. Okay. I, I wanna, want to. I'm, I'm doing stand up. Yeah, I not tour, but you have a family. I, yeah. I have a family, so I don't want. I, I would like to go out once in a while, but yeah. I just want to build up my act and okay. and maybe put it online or put out a DVD. Like, okay. I'm fine with that. Like, I don't have big career aspirations as far as like. I, I moved here wanting to be the most famous guy in the world, and then I watched people be famous, and I was like, I don't want that. Yeah. You know what I would really like actually is to be a writer. Okay. Love to be a writer. Okay. Yeah. Dave Anthony, writer, actor, father, comedian. Very funny. So grateful to have you guys here. Yeah, no, it's Thanks, awesome. Man. What a pleasure. Yeah. Yeah, it's a yeah, pleasure great. to talk awesome. to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you too. Um, okay, so uh, we're going to be back in two weeks on December 5th. We're going to have the whitest kids you know. Yeah, December 5th, oh, we have yeah. Allie and Georgia are going to come on. Allie and Georgia, it's a Allie comedy food demo. It's unbelievable, these, these kids. They're so smart and so funny, and they mix... They've learned how to mix drinks and food together uh, to make it into one thing, like one entity, and they do this funny, ba it's, yeah, very it's funny, funny, very funny. And, uh, and Trevor Moore and Sam Brown Trevor from Moore The Whitest Kids You Know. Whitest Kids You Know. So, another and, awesome and then, episode. And they're coming uh, December 5th, and then uh, uh, I gotta tell you, there's amazing people, you're gonna have, um, you're gonna have Jeff Garland's gonna come, uh, Andy Kindler's gonna come, Margaret's gonna come. Uh, Margaret Cho is going to come, and uh, then we're going to start doing theme shows. We're going to start doing. We're going to do a tribute to UCB. We're going to do a tribute to the Groundlings. We're going to do a tribute to the Fake Gallery. We're going to have people that perform there. We're going to have music. We're going to have comedy. I'm going to have a stroke, um, <laughs> and uh, there's no question about that. Uh, I can't help it uh, because I I need to rest. Um, no, but I've really enjoyed this. It's been a great night. Um, keep coming back. It works if you work it. Mm -hmm. And uh, <laughs> that's how I end all my shows. And this week in comedy, see you December 5th. Thank you.